at the end of the day, when someone like myself comes home from prison after doing a, you know, several amount of years, if we don't receive any kind of skills, if we don't receive any kind of training, you know, to help us re-enter society, where does it leave us? You know, where does it really leave us? It'll leave us only with knowing what we do know how to do. And what we do know how to do is the bad stuff. You can make a bad decision and pay for it. But when you get a second chance, don't give up. Don't allow your past to dictate who you are today. Second chance. It's a catchy phrase. But do we really mean it when we tell people coming out of prison that once you've paid for your crimes, you deserve the opportunity to lead a productive life? For many ex-prisoners, that promise is hollow. I'm Steve Handelman. Today on Criminal Justice Matters, we're going to explore the visible barriers to employment and the invisible barriers faced by those who've been caught in the criminal justice system. Wes Thompson and August Arias happen to be authorities on the subject, though both might wish they weren't. We're pleased to have them with us on the program. Let's talk a little bit about what it was like for for both of you guys when you came out of prison, get into the job market. Wes, what um, happened here? Well, upon my release, um, I had a, a kind of like I went through the same thing that pretty much everybody who's been to prison and come home with a conviction on or off parole. Um, you know, going out, filling out applications, and you know, I did land some interviews um, here and there. But um, would I say that um, I I believe personally, and you know, I'm, people who've gone through the same things would say goes to say too. You kind of feel that, you know, along when you go out for these interviews and you, you know, you check this box and you sit down in this interview and it's like that, uh, that elephant in the room. When is this person going to ask the question, you know, or, you know, before you even get to the point where there's an interview where it's like you're just putting in your application, it's like, you know, they're not going to call me back because, like you said, uh, the person who's handing in the application that doesn't have it checked, that's supposed to be the person who has it checked, they're not going to, they're not initially going to, you know, reach out to the person that has the check. So for me, it was very difficult to find work. Is it, is it right for people coming out of prison to tell a prospective employer that they've been in prison or that they've been convicted? But would you tell somebody straight out? You know, before you if, if, I, if, I don't, if I don't have to, I wouldn't. Why? Because nine out of ten times, you're not going to get past the interview. You're not going to get, you know, you're not, not going to be considered. They're going to tell you, we'll call you. Wes? Um, I'd say if I sat down in front of someone, do they have the right? I believe that if this person is employed and they're looking to employ, they have the right to ask the question because they want to know who they're employing. Um, would I sit down and would I give that information outright? Um, not upon sitting down. Um, if it came up throughout the interview um, and I felt like I was being considered for the position, then I'd reveal it. But if, there's, if I'm not even being considered, then it makes no sense to even reveal it. It's a life sentence for some people, even if they've been up for a misdemeanor or something like that. When they go out in the job market, you know, they feel done. That's for the, for the rest of their working life. But you found a way, I think you were telling me, to get around it in some ways. That when you, if you could make a connection, when I was released, I, I, I participated in a program called Times Square Inc. Um, that's based out of Midtown Community Court. And they taught us several ways to answer the difficult question. That's what I was saying. Um, have you ever been convicted of a felony? And they taught us, when we go to a job interview, to be prepared for when that question comes. And when it comes, don't feel like we do feel inside for those of us that have been incarcerated, like, oh, here comes, you know, the question. And, you know, all of a sudden now your shoulders start sinking. You start looking down or looking away. In reality, we did, we did the time for whatever crime we did. Look the potential employer in the eye, the interviewer, and tell him, sure. It was a difficult time in my life. I made some bad choices. It was a time that whatever, you know, this and this was going on. Um, however, since then, um, I've gone to college. I've gotten um, 28 college credits. I have um, become a father. I'm a proud father of a 15-month-old son. Um, I've completed a job training program at Times Square, Inc. And, you know, continue to go on or, or take them down a different path. You answered the question that you were incarcerated, and now you've, you've shown them everything you've accomplished since then. And hopefully that would be, you know, be enough for them to say, Okay, well, he was honest. 
An estimated 65 million Americans have gotten in trouble with the law at some point in their lives. Depending on the states they live in, many are permanently barred from certain careers by job restrictions and hiring bans that don't appear to recognize the promise of redemption implicit in our system of justice. This year may be a turning point in efforts to even the playing field for those who have been arrested or convicted. In January, Pepsi settled a $3 million job discrimination suit with the federal government that requires it to end a blanket ban on hiring ex-felons. The New York Bar Association has proposed a change in state law to allow more types of criminal records to be sealed. Many states, such as Ohio, are taking a second look at job restrictions. To help us sort through the political and social implications of these and other developments, we invited Mindy Tarlow and Ann Jacobs to our roundtable. Mindy's a former New York City government official and now director of the City Center for Employment Opportunities. Anne heads John Jay College's Prisoner Reentry Institute. She has over 40 years' experience in the criminal justice field, concentrating particularly on women inmates. So, Mindy, let's start with you. There's a lot of things obviously going on, as I just said. Does that mean the things are actually changing and looking up? Um, I think there's a real opportunity right now. I think the economic condition being the way it is, the focus on underserved communities being the way it is during these economic times of joblessness and increased poverty, mm -hmm. I think there's a growing awareness that people who have criminal records, people who are coming home from prison to these very same communities are really part of what the focus needs to be about solving the problem of unemployment and joblessness in these underserved communities. So yes, I've seen a shift in thinking, I've seen a shift in focus um, that I'm actually quite uh, excited about. Um, mm -hmm. I think this is a really very interesting time for this field. you just been made last month chair of the committee uh, for the Work for Success program that Governor Cuomo has just announced. So that suggests that New York is moving further ahead than other states. But um, what exactly um, is it going to mean? The training is going to improve, but how are you going to cross that barrier? How is, how is that actually going to happen to convince employers that it's worth taking a chance on ex-offenders? Well, one of the things about New York is I think it has one of the most robust community corrections infrastructure probably in the world. Um, and among the organizations that focus on people with criminal records, there are several that focus on meeting their employment needs. I think what the Work for Success Committee is designed to do is several things to improve upon those community-based providers' ability to connect those people to full-time employment. We plan to improve the job readiness of people while they're inside so they come home more prepared to work. We're trying to sort of rationalize the system of mm. how people who are coming home from prison get to employment programs that are the right programs for them at the right time. Um, not every program works for everyone. Um, mm. These are people we're talking about at a very specific point in their lives. So what we're going to try to do with this committee is make sure that the right people get to the right program at the right time so that the organizations and community-based providers that are already doing, I think, a very good job at connecting people to the labor market, we can do an even better job by making sure that we're getting people to the right program for them at the right time. Let's go back to that for a second. But let me, Anne, let me, let me turn to you, uh, play devil's advocate. Is it ever wrong for an employer to take a prison uh, record or a conviction into account? I don't think anybody says that you should never take that into consideration. I mean, in fact, most people who are thoughtful about this would agree that you should take into consideration what is relevant to the job that you're asking them to do. And clearly, the kind of blanket policies that we're struggling with right now don't do that. Um, first of all, the Pepsi um, EEOC um, case that I think you were referring to earlier um, was dealing with a policy that considered arrests. Well, there are hundreds of thousands of people who are arrested who are never convicted. Surely we don't think that should preclude them from employment. And then um, there are people who are convicted of a range of offenses that have nothing to do with their ability to do the job, nor is there any consideration of how long ago the conviction was. And I think that 
we're a country that someone recently said believes in second chances. I mean, cause surely we want these people to work and to do meaningful kind of work that contributes to the societal good. And we should be much more discerning about which kinds of convictions at what point should preclude somebody from consideration for some jobs. Most people bring up the question of public safety, uh, about uh, employing ex-offenders. Even if they've been back, they've been free or clean for 10 years or 20 years, people will say, well, the recidivism rates are so high in our society that why should we take chances with public safety? Now, let me, again, play devil's advocate. Um, where do you draw the line? What I mean, clearly, uh, uh, it may be justified that a uh, convicted sex offender should not be allowed to work in or near a school. That's what seems to be a no-brainer. But there are a lot of other um, uh, professions where uh, there might be some sort of ambiguous line to be drawn. Like where, at what point, do we feel that public safety is best um, um, protected by at least drawing a line between some people who have done things wrong in their past and they shouldn't be allowed to, to go back to those professions again? We have sweeping barriers that don't make any kind of sense. Um, it, it, a conviction for, you know, many kinds of crimes should not preclude somebody from doing, from having a driver's license, which it does in some states, from being a licensed barber, from, you know, even being a security guard in certain kinds of situations. I mean, we really have to be able to look at the specific um, individual circumstances of what they're being convicted of and what's required on the job. Um, these blanket kinds of exclusions do not protect um, community safety. They are not a good way of being concerned about public safety. In fact, a much better way is to make sure that people have some encouragement um, for um, Re for rehabilitating themselves, and if they're never employable again, where's the encouragement in that? Mm -hmm. The problem, of course, is that all you need is just one bad apple, and that destroys the whole policy. We've seen that with other issues like probation, how early release. Um, is this a policy that's always going to be on tenterhooks, that it depends on the last person who uh, got a job actually being totally clean, or can we write it into, is there some way that we can convince people that um, it's part of our obligation as a society to make sure that people have an equal chance, even if they have been at one point convicted or arrested. Well, I would say, um, first of all, that people with jobs commit fewer crimes than people without jobs. So it's really in everybody's interest to make sure that people with criminal convictions have a chance to get connected to the labor market. It's in everyone's interest to do that. How do we know that? Well, there are any number of studies that are making some connections between employment and crime. And it's a complex thing, like any issue is. Um, but what we know is that people who come home from prison want to work, they need to work, and the sooner they get connected to the labor market, the better. Um, but what I would say about employers, um, you know, uh, at the Center for Employment Opportunities, uh, which I am the uh, executive director of, what we're trying to do is act as an intermediary between the job seeker and the full-time employer. And we focus on small to medium-sized businesses who don't have human resources departments, by and large, who don't have the capacity to do background checks, by and large, and who are hiring a fair number of entry-level workers mm -hmm. um, off the street which takes them time and money, and I can guarantee you that any number of folks that they're interviewing have a criminal background of some form or other. So the idea that knowing you're hiring someone with a criminal background is somehow some new thing for the small to medium-sized employer, I just don't think that that's true. What do employers tell you? Do, do they say, well, you know, I'd love to hire somebody regardless of his criminal record, but I just can't because other employees that I that who work for me say no, don't do this. I mean, what are the what are the what are the pressures on an individual employer that prevent him from considering? I think um, um, if this room were filled with employers um, who are hiring people at the entry level, they would say, I just want someone who's going to show up on time, who's going to do what I'm asking them to do, who's going to work well with other people, who's going to make an effort, and it's our job. And by our, I mean the community of folks who are helping formerly incarcerated people get connected to jobs to vouch 
for that client to give them the kind of work experience that they need so they're a job ready tested worker and I think it's there that an employer will take a chance. Um, it, it's great if the employer wants to do good, if the employer, as Ann said earlier, sort of believes in second chances, but it also needs to make good business sense for that employer. Um, and our experience is that employers who use intermediaries like CEO and like some other organizations in the city with the Osborne Association, Fortune mm -hmm. Society, the Doe Fund, there are a number of us who are helping people get connected to the labor market. Um, what we're doing is kind of vouching for the client, having provided them with work experience and training that they need. Um, and so employers are more comfortable hiring from us. And if there is any sort of a problem, they can come back to us and we can act as their human resource arm, which is something that's very valuable to the bottom line of a small to medium sized business. And I think that's what makes it work. Something like two thirds of American states now still have professional or hiring restrictions uh, when it comes to people with records or have been convicted or have served time in prison. Um, is there any chance in the next 10 years that we're actually going to change this or is it just an uphill battle? I mean, what are the politics of trying to get these things changed, especially in the climate we have now? Well, actually, it's it's the best climate that we've seen in decades. Completely agree. I mean, there is yeah. um, a recognition that we have been locking up far too many people for far too long a time. Um, there's a whole conversation about the collateral consequences of conviction that make us realize that we shouldn't do these automatic kinds of exclusion from job and housing and other kinds of basics that someone needs to construct a law-abiding life for themselves. And there's leadership at both the national level with um, President Obama and Attorney General Holder, and in certainly in New York with Governor Cuomo, um, but in other states as, as your opening comments recognize. Talk a little more about the collateral consequences. Tell us about them. Well, I think out of the kind of concern that you articulated earlier about protecting public safety, legislatures have had kind of an automatic reflex of any time they want to protect public safety, they add on some sort of law that keeps someone with a criminal record from something, whether it's access to housing, access to licensing for certain kinds of jobs. Um, and th that whole field um, is called collateral consequences. It means beyond the crime that you're convicted of, the very fact of conviction bars you from access to other kinds of opportunities. It's a life sentence that you get. It's a life sentence. Um, the thing that I'd like to add, you referred earlier and Anne followed up on this to the EEOC Pepsi settlement, and I, I think that's also something that's very encouraging um, about the future policies in this area. EEOC and Pepsi agreed to go public, and EEOC findings are often not made public, and they agreed to go public, which I think is a really important step, and I applaud them for doing it, because what it does mm -hmm. is it raises awareness about <clears throat> the power, really the unintended consequences, I think, um, of these sorts of blanket bans, just not making the connection um, between doing that and how discriminatory that practice, in fact, is. And I think raising the awareness of the private sector um, and public sector employer community is really important to making policy change in this area. And I, I really believe that the EEOC Pepsi settlement is a very significant thing. And the mm -hmm. fact that it was made public is a very significant thing that has the power to change policy. It's got to be more difficult, though, in the kind of economy we have. We're talking about people who've never been in trouble with the law, finding trouble getting jobs, having having difficulty getting jobs. So how do you, I mean, is it a problem to convince those people that they should share the job market, in a sense, with people who've done wrong? Well, I think you can make that sort of argument in any vacuum that you put yourself in. Um, I think that people just need, need to take a step back, um, and, and it should be um, um, clear and understood that Getting folks with criminal convictions connected to the labor market helps everyone. Making that person 
able to transition successfully into his or her community helps everyone. It helps the individual, it helps their family, it helps the communities in which they live, it improves public safety, and it really improves the economy. Because I think you can say a lot of things about employment and crime and prison and this and that, but one thing I think people know for sure is that prison is very expensive, and keeping so many people incarcerated is, by definition, hindering the ability to spend those resources on something else that's important to that public citizen, whether it's higher education, green spaces, health care, uh, youth development, whatever it is. We're all in this together, and employing people with criminal convictions helps everyone. Um, and I really think it's important to take that uh, uh, broad perspective when discussing this issue. Thanks to both of you. Do you, do you think you ever get over that that issue that you've been in prison, you've done time, or you've got you've no. been convicted for an arrest? No. Well, it hasn't. So it's it's there with you for the rest of your life. Well, till now it's still there with me. Wes. Well, for me, um, I'm going to say that um, I do I do still hold that. Like you know whether you know if you do a background check, it's going to come up that you know that I'm. I have two convicted of two felonies in my past. But for me, what I'd like to say for me is that I kind of wear my crime, like the felonies. Like I, I, I hold it proudly because it's something that I did in the past and it's something that I don't, I believe doesn't define me as me. So I use that as an example for people who outside looking in who wouldn't necessarily because to, I mean, at this point in my life, when I generally meet people, they don't, they don't assume that, you know, they look at me and they may like, what college did you graduate from? all these type of comments, but the thing about it is my education stopped at the eighth grade. Like, you know, I kind of had that rough childhood and I came up and did the wrong things and all that type of thing. So it's like I try to hold myself as a standard of, you know, just because a person went, has a past that way doesn't mean that that's going to determine the way they're going to be for the rest of their lives. So for me, I wear my felonies. Both of you have found jobs successfully. You've had a working career. Um, what do you tell people who are still in prison or who have been convicted? Um, that their chances are of getting a job. How do you tell them to prepare for this, this barrier, that, which is both visible and invisible? Well, first of all, I will let them know that having, having a criminal history in today's time really doesn't mean anything. The job market is, is, right. is you know, as I say, off the hook. You got people with master degrees that can't find um, jobs. So it's going to be twice as hard now. But my advice would be, as Wes was saying, and I say, don't let the past dictate who you are today. You know, you did something in the past, show everyone and yourself who you really are. And it's going to be difficult. Keep your head up and keep going to interview after interview after in interview. Because if you say to yourself, you know what, who's going to hire me? I got a record. If you start telling yourself that it's over before it begins, you're not going to get nowhere. You know, you have to believe in yourself. Even if nobody else believes in you, you got to believe in yourself. I'm, I'm going to make it. And don't give up. When the times get hard, don't say the hell with it because you're going to go back to, you know, mm -hmm. where you just left. So you just got to continue. Look, it's very difficult for me, but I believe I'm going to make it. You know, a lot of people who are in prison in the first place um, don't have the job experience or the job skills. Uh, so when they get out there, they've got this double problem of trying to get into a market that they've got no experience they may not have a high school education, much less a college education. Uh, I mean, that adds to the, the issues that they face when, because it's the same issues that brought them into trouble with the law in the first place. Mm -hmm. Now they've got them double when they go out into the job market. How do you, how do you what do you tell people when you, when you work with them? Well, generally, I would like to say, um, in, in, in a case like that, um, I always like to go to the bigger, the bigger picture is that um, if we know, like, uh, prison is supposed to be a place for correcting. It's called correctional facility. So I always say things of that nature should be addressed while in prison. That this person should receive some type of education. This person should see, receive some type of uh, job training and things of that nature. Um, again, it, it's it's an added barrier. Like you know, what can you do? This person is coming home. He has no skills. So it's it's like. We, do we put this person in a program? Do we get this person some type of training? Or do we tell this person again, um, as I spoke to earlier, um, the work that he 
that he uh, did while he was incarcerated, you know, the, that should count for something. Because, uh, you know, there is prison labor, and most people who are incarcerated, they work some type of job throughout the time that they're in the system. So that could be used as job experience, too. Are you guys both comfortable with the fact that wherever you go from now on, that's going to be over your, over your head? I mean, should there be a way to seal those criminal records once and for all? I mean, two-thirds of the states, um, U.S. states, have restrictions um, on hiring people. And you have the, a movement to seal criminal records after a certain amount of time. Well, so I'm the forgetting the forever rules. I'm, I'm, I'm big on this. In New York State, since I'm living in New York State, I, I believe that the application shouldn't ask, have you ever been convicted of a felony? I think they should read something as, have you ever been convicted in the last seven years or ten years? Mm -hmm. You know, because it gives somebody an opportunity to come home, right, and show that after four, five, six, seven years, you've been living productive. So they shouldn't have to know if something happened 20 years ago or 30 years ago. That could affect my employment today. And and also, like, as Wes was saying, in correctional facilities, if they're going to prepare someone to come out, especially in today's market, right? I'm of, of an opinion if you want to buy meat, you're going to go to a meat market. You need lumber, Home Depot. So prepare the, prepare the prisoners that are going to be released for jobs that realistically they can get. Like, I, like I'll give you an example. Um, working, working, um, in, in a rehab, right? Um, trying to be a, a alcohol and substance abuse counselor. It's a plus if you have a criminal record. It's a plus if you once was an addict. You know, you don't have to hide the fact that you were incarcerated. They're looking, you know, to see that because if you change and you can show these people that, you know, you can be off drugs, you can be employed. Mm -hmm. It's a plus. There aren't that going to be that many of those type of jobs available. Though. Well, according, according to the computer, it says that those um, jobs for alcohol and substance abuse counselor are on the rise. Ah. But, but not necessarily, it doesn't have to stay you know, limited to that. You know, give, give these guys a chance. Let them have their driver's license. They're always looking for people to be drivers that could, that could find some kind of a job. But if you limit them, you can't get your driver's license when you come home. Now you're even uh, um, reducing the possibilities of employment. Start teaching the people that are going to be released, you know, the trades that they're going to be able to find when they're released. Second chance is possible. It is possible. It is possible. Thanks, guys. Thanks for coming. The never-ending challenge in criminal justice is how to strike the balance between public safety and our obligations to ensure that those who have paid the price for their crimes get that second chance. When I asked Professor Jonathan Jacobs, chair of John Jay's philosophy department, what, if anything, society owed those it had once locked up, his answer was direct and simple. The state, he told me, had no right to disable its citizens forever. Please let us know what you think. You can reach us on Facebook and by email. See you next month on Criminal Justice Matters.